Welcome to the Caribbean Actoral Association's 2021 virtual conference with attendees and, and with attendees from across the world joining us to embrace the disruption. My name is Rohan Hall. I'll be your moderator for this session, which is entitled Social, which is entitled Solar Punk, Climate Risk, and Climate Disclosures. Allow me to introduce our speaker, Dale Hall. Dale is Managing Director of Research for the Society of Actuaries Research Institute. In his role, Dale is responsible for managing research projects and experience studies across the SOA's wide variety of actual practice areas and markets and coordinating strategic research partnerships. He's a frequent speaker at insurance and retirement industry meetings to highlight SOA research, including research presentations to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and Congressional Committee testimony on pension plan mortality rates. He has appeared on behalf of the SOA in a variety of media outlets, including National Public Radio, C-SPAN, and National Geographic's Breakthrough Series, and hosts the SOA's Research Insight podcast. Prior to joining the SOA in 2013, Dale spent over 20 years in the U.S. insurance industry, primarily as chief actuary for the life, health, companies of country, financial, and as adjunct professor in the actual, in the actual science program at Illinois State University. He earned his MBA in finance from Capital University and his BS in mathematics from John Carroll University. This session is expected to last approximately one hour. And here are a few housekeeping items. All participants will be on mute throughout the session. Questions should be submitted in the Q&A box and will, be asked at the, and will be asked at the appropriate time. We ask that you keep your videos off to minimize potential connectivity issues. This session will be recording and uploaded to the CAA's website and or active view. In participating in this session, you are given permission to the CAA to use any text, photo, any text, photos, or videos taken within this session. This would not be a Caribbean conference without entertainment, and we have a fun-filled virtual social package planned for you, which includes yoga and exercise this afternoon. Don't forget to follow us at Caribbean Actual Association on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you to all our sponsors and conference partners. Without them, this conference would not be possible. And now I hand over to Dale. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, Rohan. Thanks for the introduction. What a you know, great pleasure to be with you here at the Caribbean Actuarial Association's annual conference. Wish, uh, wish we could do this again in person, but uh, holding out hope that that will be the case as we, uh, as we round into 2022. Um, Really glad to be here. Really glad to over, give an overview of, of things that are happening at the SOA Research Institute and, and in particular on this, this kind of new and growing topic of climate risk. Um, I did sit through Nick Jessup from Moody's, his presentation on some of the asset information that is, uh, that is evolving quickly, it seems, in climate risk and financial disclosures. And we'll add and expand for sure on that, maybe even give you a little bit deeper detail on some of the research that we've been doing at the SOA, but also I think it's a, a really good key and core opportunity for the next generation of actuaries to get more involved in climate risk. I, I kind of paint the parallel, so to speak, to what happened maybe in my generation where investment and asset and asset liability management and enterprise risk management were a growing opportunity for the actual profession. and. And we created lots of tools, lots of opportunities to run uh, economic scenario generators and, and equity scenarios to kind of assess what the risk is on our insurance and pension and other blocks of business. And I think the same is kind of a, a neat and, and growing and cool opportunity for climate risk uh, scenarios and climate risk financial analysis going forward. I wanted to level set, since we had a little bit of time here at the start, um, on the Society of Actuaries Research Institute, just to tell you where some of these projects are coming from. 
and maybe even give you a further detail or insight as to the types of research that the SOA is doing through this research institute to kind of benefit things that you can use in your daily practice, things that you know, can make you a better actuary for your employers, and even, even those outside you know, the pure actuarial profession, industry, trade regulators, um, you know, pension authorities, things like that, you know, things that we're doing to highlight what the actual profession is all about. So research is definitely a core part of the SOA since its, since its early days. I mean, even the, the start of the actual profession um, internationally through a couple joining of, of different organizations in the US uh, really had research at its core. Some, some companies wanted to investigate their individual life mortality experience and, and then you know, became kind of inappropriate antitrust, so to speak, to just send mortality information back and forth between companies. So an association was really a helpful place to do that. And the SOA became that actuarial profession a central repository for, for data. And from that, we've been doing a wide set of experience studies ever since. Um, more actually than just individual life mortality anymore. I think we could probably list 20 or 25 or 30 different insurance and pension and, and public experience studies that we now have on our list that recur every few years. You know, many of them in flight kind of all the time. And as insurance products have even, even gotten more complex and there's more contingencies actually to study, um, you know, utilization of benefits and, and variable policies that have options that people can exercise. I mean, all these things need to be studied. Experience needs to be aggregated and studied and the SOA has been proud to do that for a long time. You know, I'll note we even have probably nearing completion in its last stages is a experience study on, on pensioner mortality featuring some uh, local Caribbean jurisdictions, local Caribbean markets, and looking at their pension scheme mortality. So look for more on that coming the first part of 2022. You know, we also do a lot of what I'll call practice and in-house research. These are reports that we publish that are on kind of current event topics of the day. They, they highlight things that are going on in the world around us, places where actuaries are either doing work or can be thought leaders on. Um, sometimes we uh, we'll, we'll fund those and find an external researcher to do that. Sometimes we'll do that internally. We'll, we'll run a survey or we'll do some research internally. And I would say through the COVID era and into what we're doing now, each of us on staff has taken uh, three or four different projects each year and, and internally driven that research. So we've got a really good core team um, among the staff at the SOA who can put research projects together, who can help organize activities, work with our committees for the betterment of information out to the actuarial profession. There's two, two quick uh, links on the bottom of the page if you have time later, take a look at the soa.org research institute page, gives a background and overview of all that's going on there. And then something new that we just started probably in the last two or three months, soa.org forward slash new research. So we've got a member of our communications team who's out putting on that part of the website about every two or three weeks, you know, new things that are coming out, new reports. So if you if you star that one or highlight it or save it as a bookmark uh, and go back to it with some frequency, you'll start to see, you know, the new things that are out there. I will say too, you know, the, over the past few years, we've we've really tried to build up the types of research that we do and and very specific uh, programs for the actuarial profession. So we started creating what we call strategic research programs. These, these are places where we know actuaries are, are working day to day across the whole world in these types of topics. You see them listed on the right hand side of the screen and, and kind of in tune with the presentation today, one of the, one of the most recently released uh, strategic research programs is to do more research on what we call catastrophe and climate research. I'll take one step back and just note as well that our diversity, equity, inclusion strategic research program was launched, oh, you know, around 18 months ago. And there's just a continuing set of things that we're studying on, you know, how the actual profession and how our consumers who are, who are involved in financial services, you know, have some DEI uh, things to study. It's, it's kind of mortality by race and ethnicity. It's how aging and saving for retirement impact different uh, different groups in different ways. So I think proudly we're trying to bring to the forefront 
you know, more of diversity, equity, inclusion type research to shine a light on where financial services and, and places that sound the, surround the actual profession can do improve increasingly uh, better at serving uh, those types of communities. We've been doing cat catastrophe and climate research for a little bit over five years. It started with a smaller committee that was starting to look at climate and environmental sustainability and started publishing, you know, three or four reports every year and then realizing as, as the conversations got bigger on what the world was thinking about on the impact of climate risks, not only on our economies around the world, but how they related to financial services and insurance and pension and places where the actual profession works. So we did create this formal catastrophe and climate strategic research program just launched in early October, 2021. And over the past couple of months, that's where you've seen a, a really wide volume of new reports that we've been putting out, highlighting things that actuaries can be aware of and use in their employers and consulting firm practices and, and be thought leaders on those topics. You know, it really is, I think, the right topic at the right time. Um, you know, all you had to do was watch in, in late October through the first two weeks of November what was going on at at COP26, this Council of Parties, the United Nations gathering of all the markets together and, um, and, and see you know, almost in the news every day, here were things that were coming out of this organization, this, this conference of COP26 that were related to how financial services, insurance, pensions, banking, um, could make a big difference by incenting different things. And, and I think a lot of people left COP26 going back to their local markets to say, look, this is, this is what the world has kind of decided is the right thing to do. It's already happening in some markets around the world where there's growing sets of, of climate risk financial disclosures or incentives from financial services supervisors or insurance regulators to put into place the need to disclose to the public, you know, all that's going on and, and what the risks might be. Um, you, you see that rapidly already in place in places like England with the Prudential Regulatory Authority. Um, you see that already kind of growing in Europe. You see that already in Japan and some of the Asia Pacific uh, markets where they're, they're doing a lot of focus on, on climate risk. And we'll, we'll get into what some of those disclosures, you may have heard them in some other sessions here, but it's really becoming an important part of what you know, is growing as I think a big opportunity for the actuarial profession. I'll note on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, we did some, some market surveying ourselves of, of our members to say, you know, we're hearing that climate risk in actuarial work is potentially a, a growing trend. Um, what do you think as members you see both today and in the future? And on the bottom left is, is kind of the current snapshot. We asked people, what is the current incidence of you doing some sort of climate analysis or climate risk assessment in your actuarial work. And it was about you know, 10%, probably not surprising, one out of 10. And then maybe you focused a little bit more on either enterprise risk management or in property insurance or, or things like that, where you know, big, events, big events can happen and they become very important for the loss ratios of, of insurance companies. But then we said, let's take a look like two to three years forward. What do you sense is in your company or in your consulting work is the projected incidence of climate risk in the things that you'll be doing. And, and it grew to be over three out of 10 people were saying, yes, you know, that's something that I anticipate will be part of my role or part of what I do in pricing or reserving or financial analysis or estimation or consideration as I do broad risk management for mortality or health or property or, or different motor insurance or, or things like that. So it, it's certainly on the rise. It's, it's not, you know, yet a hundred percent, but I think, similar to other analogies that we've seen in the profession over the last couple of decades, this is something that is growing as an opportunity. And it's sort of confirmed on the right-hand side too. This is a, a clip of, uh, of a set of survey results from the Financial Stability Board. The, the group of 20, 20 large economic uh, countries uh, around the world gathered together and, and we'll see that's where some of the climate risk disclosure concepts sort of came from. There is there, a subgroup of them is the Financial Stability Board. Really, their goal is to make sure that their local economies have financial stability through insurance and banking and, and all the different oversight that they do. And they began to then ask, uh, oh, I think there was over 100 insurance and reinsurance companies to participate 
in a snapshot survey of, you know, where do you think over time, where have you seen it? And then where do you see it currently? The path might be going for things like the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. That's kind of a, uh, an acronym for a generic set of recommended disclosures that have emerged. And we can get in a little bit deeper into that. But clearly across the different horizontal lines that you see on the right hand side of the screen, whether it's board oversight, whether it's incorporating climate risks into your, uh, your strategy of your management, whether it's you know, the risk management processes that you uh, build into your company, whether it's just you know, general metrics that you follow as an organization or are following in the world around us. These are the types of things that are slowly growing over time. And, it's, and, it's, and then slow growth is probably the right way to describe it. Uh, over the past couple of years, you know, it has slowly grown to be at the levels that are seen in those 2020 bars. And I imagine we'll, we'll see another survey of this coming up in the next few months with 2021 results. But I also think you know, the, the right-hand side of the screen probably says it's still a little bit of glass half empty, but opportunity. There are very few parts on the right-hand side of the screen where over 50% of insurance companies that were surveyed are taking the steps to build climate risks into their strategy, into their risk management. But I think quickly, those bars will grow a little bit further as 2021, 2022, and, and, and successive years come around. So I imagine we'll look back at this survey in two or three years from now and just see how that glass was, was slowly filled to where this becomes a more common thing for financial service companies and insurers to do. Um, I'll note as well that we you know, obviously have a website that is a hub for all that is going on here. So if you want to take a little bit of time and double back at your convenience to the catastrophe and climate uh, part in the research, a part of the SOA website, you simply go to SOA.org, you pull down on the Research Institute, you'll see catastrophe and climate quickly listed there. And it's a great resource, not only for reports that we publish, but I would say a lot of different data sources, a lot of different tools. I mean, half the battle as in assessing any type of risk is just finding the data to see what the trends are, what the current status is. That's what we do for mortality. It's what we do for healthcare. It's what we do for, for property or auto losses or things like that. We gather data, we look for sources, and then we use it to evaluate what the trends and risks would be. Well, the good thing is, is that data sources for, for different climate variables have been have been collected by a wide variety of people all around the world and really down to local geographies for many, many years. Post-World War II, this became a really important thing for, for countries all around the world, literally, to, to collect information as on, on weather patterns so they could have good agricultural resources. Um, it, it's amazing if we just even look at the US, that's just one drop in the bucket of all that is out there around the world for things like you know, daily precipitation down to a very finite level and, and temperatures, lows and highs and, and wind speeds and all sorts of humidity variables, all sorts of things that are out there that you can actually track and then see the, the trends and change over time. So there's a wide variety of research projects. There's a wide variety of tools. I'll even center on the right-hand side of the screen. You, you may be familiar with our actuaries climate index, which is a index across the four North American organizations to, to look at what the frequency of extreme weather events happens to be in the US, Canada. Also, you know, the fourth one down here is this tool for extracting subsets of data. The Global Historical Climate Network, or GHCN, is a really powerful tool that's out there. It's not the only data set that's out there, but um, this is a tool that we've created that you can use to kind of ping against the whole GHCN daily data set. If you want to collect information just for a certain country, just for a certain location, and sometimes just for specific latitudes and longitudes, uh, it's pretty impressive that the wide variety of, of climate and weather data that is out there. So I imagine that will only grow and we'll build even more tools for that type of stuff in the future. And then if you're a, a listener to podcasts or, or you know, watcher of videos, um, both through what the SOA publishes, through our YouTube channel, through our podcast. There's a wide variety of research insights podcasts that are out there. Um, we're on the path to develop our own Society of Actuaries Research Institute channel within ActuView. So, so kudos to the people who run that for us, for allowing us to kind of post 
some different videos on that site that highlight different climate related projects as well. So look for that and more to come. You know, the, the title to this session, I have to admit, you know, may have sounded a little bit different or, or been a little bit different when you looked at it on the, uh, the general agenda for the meeting and included the word solar punk, um, which was, you know, kind of a new vocabulary to me as we started into developing this presentation. But I think it's, uh, it's a good segue into, you know, what the, what our world as actuaries may look like and, and a pretty good analogy uh, with solar punk. So if you if you go to you know Google and, and Google the word solar punk, or if you go to Wikipedia and pull it up, I've I've tried to summarize, I guess, some of the, the general highlights here. It asks this type of question, you know, what if what if we solved uh, this huge major contemporary challenge with related to, to climate risk? And you know, what would what if what would happen if we solved all these problems with an emphasis on making the world that we live in more sustainable or recognizing better you know how to prevent climate change or maybe mitigate the growth of climate change you know climate change is is sometimes measured in the amount of um, you know in, in it, it 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 reveals itself i guess in different weather and climate patterns maybe driven a lot by what happens with emissions from greenhouse gases over time, and then not only those emissions kind of accumulate and what the current concentration uh, would be, and then also, you know, for pollution, you know, what if we were to, you know, do better and solve some of these challenges, you know, it asks the question, what, what would the world look like? And, and so many authors, many writers, many artists, you know, those who have a tendency to kind of think down that line and create the storylines of I don't maybe not what it looks like today, but go out into the future and, and think about what it could look look like. It's become this interesting subgenre of science fiction, and and probably as you can imagine, it, some of the writings on this have to deal with you know changing dystopia into utopia. If we went down one path, we unfortunately might have some dystopian society. But if we solve these major contemporary challenges then we have a better society and it combines that with, with fantasy. And you can imagine, I'll bring up on the screen here just a, a couple of visuals as to, as to what artist portrayal of that might look like. You know, can you imagine that in large cities uh, in any part of the world, we, we might still have high rise buildings, but those high rise buildings would be you know, built with solving that type of challenge in mind. And so you know, a lot of you know, plants you know, kind of coexisting with the, the large uh, buildings that we might know in our big cities today. Or similarly, will there be some evolution of you know, humans with, uh, with, with nature and, and one artist's portrayal of that? I think these you know, probably are some sort of residents with trees growing around them. Or even in, you know, in the Caribbean environment, you know, just this combination of having you know, more green associated with our cities or, or using space in a better way and, and, and kind of being at one with nature and the, the ocean and things like that. So you can create your own fantasy or your own image of, I guess, what that would be. These are just three examples of it. But what is you know, solar punk or the, the concept of, of solving or thinking about climate change solutions have to do with the actual profession? Well, I think it, it really lends down to this. I mean, solar punk says, hey, there's there's what if we had this growing community focus to focus more deliberately on the way sustainability and environmental security and, and climate change may be solved as an industry, as a as a worldwide focus. And I think that's st starting to happen a little bit also on, with regards to climate risk. Um, regulators and, and industry are recognizing that, hey, if we come together, we have an important role to play to think about ways that our industries can be leaders in, in implementing things. And I think there, there is a tendency for an increase in regulatory focus and implementing either more regulation or supervision to incense a, a strong, good participation in sustainability. I think, I think the, the end of the day, financial services organizations and regulators and supervisors realize, especially because of the amount of assets that are held, within the financial services industry that, that financial services organizations really can be a main influence on expediting or at least maintaining uh, climate trends or mitigating adverse climate trends. You know, if, if the phrase money talks or, or dollars speak or, or investments speak is kind of the way that things 
are incented to get done, then financial organization, services organizations and the amount of assets they hold you know, can be really helpful in, in getting a first start there. So what has evolved is financial disclosures and climate risk scenarios have been uh, evolving in many markets around the world. And so I'll start on the, the top left here. And this really is one of the first things that that came out probably about four or five years ago now, the recommendations of the task force on climate related financial disclosures. And you may have heard in other sessions, you know, this TCFD acronym being, uh, being commented on or referred to, I think TCFD will be a acronym that we use more and more in our actuarial vocabulary in the years to come, but the group of 20 created a financial stability board and they then turn created a task force and said, what would be the right things to ask different financial services companies or potentially any corporation if we wanted to get deeper into what, what risks they face related to climate? And, you know, it could be an insurance company, but it could be, um, you know, a manufacturer. It could be really anyone who is a publicly traded company or a private enterprise. And you walk through a set of questions and say, if these events were happen, you know, what type of financial events would ensue? Um, from the climate risks, both on your assets, on your liabilities, on your operations, so to speak. Um, that is then translated well into you know, other jurisdictions kind of taking this up and asking the same question. On the bottom right, you have the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, who are now looking to build more climate change risk scenarios into their own risk and solvency assessments that they're asking of companies. And then, you know, close to my home, at least, the NEIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, has really, really tried to ramp this up. And I expect that momentum to grow even further over the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, the NEIC has had a climate risk disclosure statement in the past, probably for like the last seven or eight years. It was predominantly driven by just a couple states, so not all insurers were necessarily filling it out. It did ask some good questions, but it was limited to pretty much more qualitative answers to about eight or 10 different questions. And you know, there's different assessments that have been done on the data that has come from that. But to this point now, the NEIC said, look, that's been good to do in the past, but we really need to focus on this more. And so they now have a climate and resiliency, resiliency task force at their highest level, at the executive level. And many states that are part of that national association are contemplating ways to to ask companies in their jurisdictions to do more. So even most recently, the New York Department of Financial Services, which is a pretty influential department among the full NAIC, has created a climate risk subdivision. And they're now creating you know, their process forward to say, you know, companies that are licensed to do business here in the state of New York will need to follow this type of path. And even with their regular climate risk disclosure, it's grown from just two or three states asking companies to fill it out to somewhere around eight to 10 or 12 states. And that has really grown the percentage of the US insurance company population that's been focusing on this. The last thing I note here is that we, you know, there's a tendency also towards what's called impact weighted accounting for companies. It may be a little bit different than financial disclosures, but you know, the concept here being, if you, regardless of what type of company that you are, um, how can you, show what the net impact of your operations are from you know like a carbon sort of accounting if if you're putting um, if you're using a lot of energy to to create or manufacture materials you know then maybe you have a negative impact weighted accounting for your company if you're investing in more green assets instead of brown assets if you're doing you know more more green things if you're implementing good strategies then maybe you have a positive impact weighting accounting for your company. So that phrase, you know, may start to resonate a little bit more as we as we hear it across uh, different risk disclosures in the future. And I would say, you know, sometimes we think of catastrophe and climate not just as, as more of a property casualty insurance industry risk. I'm probably guilty of that myself. I grew up in an insurance company that had life and health insurance and investments, but also a really big property casualty side to it as well. And, you know, uh, I'm definitely guilty of saying, oh, when, when hurricanes happen or when tornadoes happen, well, yeah, that's, that's kind of a property casualty insurance risk. I don't need to worry about it necessarily in my life health assessment. But I think we're coming to the realization that because of the incentives that might be coming for assets and, and really the, the growth of the impact 
of catastrophic events and maybe even climate change onto morbidity and mortality. It really is not just a property casualty insurance industry risk anymore. And it starts, um, you know, if you start to list in the bottom of the page, what are the different risk categories that we all tend to think about for our insurance companies? It might be assets, liabilities, operations, or reputational risk. Climate risk can have definitely an impact on all, the, all those. It might be thought of as an all box checker when it comes to these different risk categories. I think the pandemic is also something else, unfortunately, that, that hit on many, if not all of these risk categories as well. But, but on the asset side, for sure, I mean, with such large amounts of assets being used to pre-fund future liabilities, whether you're a health insurer, a life insurer, critical illness, a pension fund, I mean, we all need those assets to perform well and strong to support the future liabilities that are coming. And the additional revenues, the premiums we collect will, will be added to that asset mix, mix to fund you know, those even further. So assets are a really big part of it. And again, the Moody's presentation earlier today on you know, environmental sustainability and governance of your assets, ESG, is, is a really important part of what's happening there. But it is broader. We'll, we'll show a couple examples of it impacting our liabilities. I think you know, we don't want climate risk to necessarily impact our operations. So where we place our operations and how we can diversify our operations. We also think it could be you know, a reputational or employee risk. We want employees to work for our companies that know, you know that we're committed. Our future employee base of, of the world is much more focused on, on climate and, and sustainability than on probably any generation before it. And so to have a good set of employees and to good, be of good reputational risk for consumers, I think those enter into the equation here as well. Um, there's a really good paper that is circulating around right now that I want to point people to, and, and it kind of has that asset flavor to it as well. The International Actuarial Association has created a working paper among a series of different related papers, but I think this one resound, resounds really well for life and health insurers. It's it's the application of climate-related risk scenarios to asset portfolios. So how do I take climate scenarios and kind of assess what the financial impact of them might be to my investments that I'm making? And you'll see in that paper, you know, maybe we can share the link to it here is, or send it out to uh, attendees after the whole event. But th there's the importance of doing top-down macroeconomic views, but then also down to your individual holdings. What is what is this bond that I'm holding? What's its risk for, for climate risk as compared to another bond? How do I make decisions? The paper also has some really good case studies on key life and health risks, especially you know, making sure that your facilities are, are up to speed and, and not at risk of interrupting your operations. So a lot of different things to think about from that front. I think you know, some things on the climate risk side that we hear people talking about as well is you know, does it make anything less independent? You know, we've seen presentations through this uh, conference on things like business interruption risk. We've seen the pandemic kind of come into play as well. And that's always raised that type of question, you know, are the risks that we're insuring um, truly, truly all independent? And I think historically we would say, well, mortality risks, you know, my exposure to the force of mortality has to be different than everyone else's uh, exposure to that risk. And, and that can be true to some extent, but I think what happens with climate and catastrophe events is suddenly you know, big impacts happen over wide, wide geography areas. So some pictures at the bottom of the screen show things like um, you know, wildfire risks that are happening you know, in Australia or in the in Northern California, and all of a sudden, instead of it just being a very localized event, it's covering you know literally hundreds, if not thousands, of square miles. And all of a sudden, you know, what was thought to be independent of events or independent risks when it comes to life or health insurance, um, you know, may not be as so. And I don't know if we'll ever get to a point, you know, where that's, you know, that it's not diversifiable or you can diversify it away. But I think the companies are probably paying a lot more attention now to, you know, how their risks ge geographically might be related or how do these potential climate risks apply to many of their risks simultaneously. If I'm only writing group life insurance in, in two or three states, then how do I diversify my writings to make sure that it's applicable and across different, different places? And it may lead as well to, 
the need to discuss potential public-private industry solutions. We've seen that happen with, with terrorism in some markets. We've seen that happen with flood risk in some markets. We've certainly seen that you know, being among the conversation for business interruption in some other markets. And not saying that we'll necessarily need to get there, but I think people are coming to this potential conclusion that if a, a natural catastrophe or a climate risk has an adverse effect, you know, would there be a desire in any market to have some sort of public or government backstop beyond which you know, claims could be covered? And you hear you know, that being talked about a little bit more actively under the, the newer part of climate risks. And, and part of this too is that climate risks um, used to be waved off a little bit as kind of just lower socioeconomic risks. So you know, if, if I was facing a wildfire, if I was facing a, a hurricane or something like that, then my common reaction maybe 20 years ago would say, well, you know, my insureds, they're, they're of a certain level of socioeconomics where they can get out of the way or they have the ability to protect themselves. And so you might have a historical tendency to say that climate risk, you know, is, is, it can't be found in my book of business because I'm only covering people who have higher incomes or have higher educations. But I think we've seen that trend, you know, slowly change over the past 10 or 20 years. Um, we've seen through some studies that wildfire impact in 2001 through 2010 may, yes, have had lower socioeconomic risk, but now when these wildfires start happening in highly populated and high net worth counties in places like California or Lake Tahoe or in Sydney or Melbourne or, or different parts around the world, or when inland flood impacts are, you know, used to be perhaps more lower socioeconomic, but then Hurricane Ida, even in recent times, you know, came across into the Atlantic through the Caribbean, made landfall, but then just wasn't done. And it, it paved a path all the way across the Mideast into the Northeast of the United States, where all of a sudden, you know, inland flood impact in places like New York City was really, really strong. And unfortunately led to, you know, higher socioeconomic uh, risks being very heavily impacted in some of those markets. So the, the world is just a little bit different when, when the climate risks occur a little bit more frequently or in larger scale ge geographically that you can't just write them off anymore. And maybe the, the final comment before highlighting a couple research projects is, you know, we, we focus a little bit on, is there an impact on, you know, the future insurability and affordability of different insurance coverages. The one that we highlighted in this particular report you see on the screen was more on crop insurance. But I think it also has some applications to, to life and maybe even specifically health insurance as well. If, if, if climate risk causes things to become less predictable, then all of a sudden we have to build some bigger ranges or some bigger margin uh, over, over and above the mean expectation of what we think the loss will be to kind of cover more contingent or less predictable events. And you know, that may start to happen not only on things like property or crop insurance, but as that cycles through, suddenly the, the commodity gets, gets more expensive to insure. And with that, the insurance gets more expensive to potentially offer. And is there a danger that, in, that ultimately the affordability of insurance coverages could be in jeopardy due to climate change. And you know, it probably won't happen today or tomorrow, but I think people have their eyes on the horizon as to what the impact of that might be. And the same thing might be for medical expense costs. If, if a continuing set of climate events or the increase in, in less predictable medical expenses comes into play, and then of course worldwide we have a growth in inflation, is there this cycle where I just need to start charging more to cover the potential losses that could happen for medical insurance. And maybe I can't even raise the premiums fast enough to cover what the inflation of those costs will be. And will it change the nature of the products that get offered? Will there be eventually you know, shorter guarantees? I'm only willing to take a very short-term risk rather than offering you know, a 10 or 20 or even a permanent life insurance policy. Or will there be more risk sharing with the insured to say, look, I'm more than willing to offer the coverage, but you, the insured, are going to participate somehow in, in, in the insurance mechanisms there. And we've seen that with probably the broader growth of variable or equity-based products where I want to focus just on the mortality risk and I'll, I'll let the insured kind of take some of the risk along with me when it comes to the, the growth in, in account balances and account values. 
This all to say that you know there's importance to all insurers, and really, I guess the bot at the bottom of the screen you see the word opportunity, and that's probably you know what I would think the actual profession needs to think of this is. Um, I think that this role of climate risk management, climate risk financial disclosures and assessment that's that's we're starting to see the way it happened is really just a natural extension of what actuarial work is doing. It's you know we've seen enterprise risk management, we've seen ALM. We've seen scenario analysis, so it's really a good opportunity for insurers, for actuaries who work in insurance. If you're a consulting actuary, there's an opportunity, and there's an opportunity for insurance supervisory leadership as well. Maybe the last thing I'll get to in the, in the last five or six minutes are just some really quick overviews of some catastrophe and climate research that we've done. Um, we wanted to study, for example, what the impact of wildfire risk was in the U.S. The report is now out on our website released in about the last uh, six weeks here, it takes a look forward as to what, how, how climate change can influence the level of wildfire risk between now and say 30 years from now. Um, actuaries are getting a lot more familiar with things like representative concentration pathways. There, there's these paths that you know, can be modeled out into the future, the trajectories of future greenhouse gas concentrations this report happened to use RCP 8.5. I will note that is a pretty, pretty intense uh, representation concentration pathway. I think it would be beneficial as well for actuaries to look at a range of things. Um, this one, you know, is a pretty severe scenario if you run it out for 100 years, but could be representative of what might happen in the next 20 or 30 years as as local markets try to, you know, bring uh, their their uh, climate change philosophies back. We studied the burn areas. AIR Worldwide was the researcher on this project and took a look at what happened to different burn areas over the last, uh, say, 20 plus years in the, in the western half of the United States, and then compared that. An important variable that is predictive here is called vapor pressure deficits. It's it's really, if you think of it, if it's if the if the air moisture is so much that it's fully saturated, it's raining, there's precipitation, then that's like a full saturation point. Um, but then you compare that to what the current amount of moisture in the air happens to be. And the difference between those two will become a vapor pressure deficit. And then you take a look at the western half of the U.S. could be done for really any market, including the Caribbean, and, and kind of subdivide the whole territories into eco provinces. These are places where, you know, they might have a uniform climate or their geography or their landforms are the same. And then studying that past burn area and, and really validating it by even more recent catastrophic years in a lot of places, you take a look at the relationship between you know, where burned areas have, have occurred and calculations of you know, representative vapor pressure deficits for all of those di different eco provinces. Of course, you know, some of those areas are forested and some are non-forested, so you probably have some some different analysis or different correlations or analytics going on depending upon that variable. But then driving that and then using you know, a general circulation model of the Earth's atmosphere in the Western half of the United States, you can then run scenarios forward and say, what does this mean for the way, uh, the way climate is going to potentially evolve under these different models? I think we looked at 18 different general circulation models before they centered in on you know, the two or three that kind of best fit what was going on here. And the, the screen shows these you know, estimates of what the increase or percentage change in annual burn areas will be in the future. And it's not to say in this case that you know, California, I mean, this is all a percentage change kind of from today looking forward. So California still will have, I think, a, a high propensity for that. But it's places, you know, maybe like Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado that saw the most radical amount of change. And if you're a health insurer or a property insurer, this might be important information for you to think about and know. What's my strategy going to be? How do I, you know, build this knowledge into what my reinsurance programs need to be, what my direct underwriting should be, how I diversify my risks across uh, different uh, geographies that I'm looking at. We did the same sort of thing too with inland flood. Um, similarly, looking out to about 30 years to 2050 on, on what would happen with both on plain or riverine flooding. That's where you know a river valley is there. And when it's when it overflows its banks, you have on plain flooding. 
And then really importantly too, it's become more important is what we call urban or off-plane flooding. You know, a big city that is, you know, might likely have, you know, s- storm sewers and other things, but with an amount of, of asphalt and concrete and things like that that can't absorb as well, what types of off-plane flooding happen in urban areas? And not only do you need to look at this through precipitation models, but there needs to be obviously a big look at hurricane models as they come through, not only on the coastline, but as they progress further inland. And some of the results that you can see in the report on the left-hand side of the screen is where we, the, the study saw a 100-year return pattern uh, max flood depths happening in the future. Um, you need to obviously compare that to what's happening today. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you see this plus or minus as to where things might be getting worse in the future, where things might be getting better in the future. So the left is really just an absolute level, but the right-hand side is more of a difference compared to 2020. And you can do the same thing for off-plane flooding in metro areas as well. The left-hand side of the screen being you know, where, where, uh, where large absolute measures may happen, the right-hand side of the screen being this differential of to where things might be getting better or worse, I note that you know in the Pacific Northwest and maybe even in the in the Gulf Coast, not even just on the coast, but one county in observations are where there tend to be some uh, tendency for growth in off-plane flooding, hurricanes, or or large storms come ashore, or large storms come west to east across the United States, dump a lot of water, and then you have these counties trying to contend with off-plane flooding. Of course, that's all good and well and good, except then you have to map it against where the risks are, where are properties, where are people, where are things happening that are being insured. So on the top of the screen, you have um, what what is the uh, on-plane annual uh, flood losses, and then on the on the top right is you know what that is projected to be um, over this potential scenarios that were run. On the bottom of the screen, the same is done for what's happening today with average annual off-plane flood losses. And the bottom right is you know, running the scenario model forward and saying what, what is potential to happen on average in the future. And you know, kind of looking at that and matching it up where, with where properties are, where people live and things like that, where this flooding is gonna have an impact to actually create losses. And then, of course, you want to kind of measure where the percentage change is is large as happening. Where are things potentially going to be different for strategy in the future? So the left-hand side of the screen is uh, the on-plane percentage increases. And the right-hand side of the screen is is off-plane flood loss percentage increases. I mean, they might actually be from a smaller base. So some of the deep red may be relative, but it's, it's, uh, it's noting where they're anticipated to be some really big off-plane flooding. I, you know, I live in the Chicago area, and we know that um, sometimes we escape that. But it looks like in in Chicago and Central Illinois, and through Indianapolis, and even Southern Illinois, uh, where there's a growing set of population um, that's and a lot of construction, and actually kind of a really uh, level. Uh, it's where a lot of agricultural happens as well. So it's a pretty level area, flat area in the U.S that there's this chance where off-plane flooding can happen in cities, there's no place for water to go, and you see this potential for that to be um, realized through losses in the future. Um, Just a quick hint at some other reports of interest. We do do an extra weather extreme report every month. Coming soon, we've got a really good project with PricewaterhouseCoopers that will highlight best practices and trends for, uh, for completing TCFD analysis and, and just looking to create more professional development opportunities on this topic. I guess in closing, I will just, you know, the opportunities are, are really here for, for growth in the profession. If you, if you invest some time to understand what climate risk financial disclosures are about, if you keep monitoring what some of the best practices are for filling out a TCFD or, or calculating climate risk financial impact through a TCFD, and then keeping an eye on how like risk-based capital standards may change. Is there going to be stronger incentives from supervisors and regulators to incent large financial services companies like insurance and pension funds to uh, invest more in green assets, so to speak? And if not, here are the capital charges. And then from just really a, a leadership position in the actual profession, I think you know we're 
we're kind of the group that can be the conduit between the science and then the financial impact. So becoming a thought leader in your own organization, I think, is a really good opportunity. So we'll leave it there with you know, some links for, for more information, questions, feedback. If you'd like to connect via LinkedIn, we certainly I certainly post quite a bit on some of the things that are happening. And maybe with that, um, I will flip it back to the full group just to see if we can walk through uh, some, of the, some of the chat or some of the questions that have come up. Hi, right, thank you very much there. It was an excellent presentation. So we have um, two questions. Um, so John is asking you just to describe the role of the project oversight groups and how Caribbean actuaries can participate. Yeah, I think it's a great question. John, thanks for prompting that. I mean, what, the great thing about especially climate risk research is it's an international sort of question. Um, you know, we all have our own local climates. We all have uh, th this type of risk analysis and financial disclosures potentially coming in the future. So I would, you know, certainly look for anyone who's interested to connect. I mean, the, the easiest way is to kind of send an email to research at soa.org, noting that you're interested in this particular topic. I will note as well, we do have a vol volunteer opportunities database that we continue to put out uh, more information across all the SOA, whether it be research pro project oversight groups or working with exams or working with, you know, creating meetings or stuff like that. So every once in a while, going out to the volunteer opportunities database that we have and seeing if there's something that piques your interest, I would say, you know, the best way is to probably connect with us one off and we can kind of keep you in the loop as to when the next opportunities come up. And there may be some that are just taking flight right now. It'd be great to, to connect Caribbean actuaries into. I think that's a really good opportunity. Okay, and we have another um, question, basically asking for comment on insurance link securities. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's an opportunity here. I mean, we've, you know, we've seen cat bonds and other things evolve, maybe more specifically on the property casualty lines of business over time. But I do think that, uh, you know, creating insurance link securities are a way in to, to, to have another risk management component for you know, insurance companies. If they, you know, if they, if, if, hopefully there's always reinsurance capacity, but if there's other alternatives or cheaper costs of, of reinsurance or, or doing capital through issuing, issuing bonds, or, you know, I think it becomes really important where, you know, what will the capital charges be if, if, um, if you hold green assets versus brown assets and, and is there any links there that, you know, if, if my risk-based capital changes because either for the positive or for the negative, or I need more capital, you know, because of certain triggers that have gone on in those risk-based capital calculations, I do think that, you know, the financial markets kind of coming in and being a part of that as a risk management or a risk mitigation solution or diversifying risk through those types of securities, you know, can, can grow to make a lot of sense. So, you know, I, I don't follow that on a daily basis, but I think that is a structure to you know think more about for risk management is a good way to go. Um, and just adding to that, Jamaica recently launched uh, a catastrophe bond, um, and later today we should actually be having um, some discussion on that. Yeah, looking really forward to hearing more about that. That's a great addition to the agenda for today. All right, I see one hand up. All right. Can you go ahead and unmute Donnie? Donnie? You can unmute and ask the question. Tony, you have the ability at the bottom of your Zoom to, to talk. 
the hand went down, so I'm, I'm assuming maybe the, the hand raise was in error, right? So we are just now at 2.45, the scheduled time for the end of this session. And we'd like to thank Dale Hall once again for joining with us and spending time with us virtually. Um, as he started out, hopefully next time around, we'll have it in person and he'll be able to enjoy some of, some of our sunshine. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, everyone, we will now break for a, a goal sponsor break session. Um, and then we will have uh, two sessions coming up next, the workshop basics, the PNC, and the micro and parametric insurance session. We hope that you all will continue to join us um, and it's great having you.